Just like Oasis, the programming language Ada was big in the 90s, fell out in the 2000s, and now has come back bigger than ever. How big, you might ask? Big enough for NVIDIA to co-publish an open source reference process using Ada and Spark in the automotive market, which is absolutely opening the floodgates for Ada adoption once again. But today, let's just get us back up to speed by talking to an expert in the field, Quinton from AdaCore. We're going to learn how Ada is different to other programming languages, where it's being used, how AdaCore fits into the mix, and how Ada developers can really benefit from their tools. Quinton, thank you very much for joining me in the studio today. First question that I've got is, why is Ada still relatively unknown to many developers? Whoa, whoa, whoa hold there. Only 12% of you are subscribed. Do yourself a favor and subscribe for daily engineering content. All right. So that's a very interesting question. I mean, if we ask you a question in return, how, how old are you, if you want me asking you? Of course not. Uh, I'm 23 years age. I've only been an engineer for about a year. Is that sort of the answer? That, that's part of the answer. So if you look at the history of language, right? Massive in the 90s was right there at the same level as C++ in terms of usage and popularity. What happened is that uh, you have this spear of time between the 90s and the, uh, and the 2000s when it's sort of way out of fashion. People started to do less of ADA and more C++, Java, those sort of things. And I think it was uh, mainly because of the fact that the problems that the language store were themselves uh, around the radar. ADA is all about safety or security. If you look at the 90s, or cybersecurity was not as big of a thing as it is today. Reliability overall for software was not as big of a thing. And software in general was smaller, right? Even if you had large code bases, I think you know, they, they gain momentum and, and more and more complexity. So today, we once again arriving into a situation where uh, the kind of properties that Ada has that we're going to discuss later become very relevant uh, mm -hmm. for markets. And as a consequence, I think that it's the reason why you're starting to hear about it again today. Cool. So it's a lot like Oasis, bit of a resurgence in the 90s and it's coming uh, back. I love it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Ada, it's very unknown to someone like me. I actually don't think I even know, you know, what the scripting looks like. What programming languages is it most similar to? So in terms of the basic paradigms, right, the, the, the structure of the language, you will see things that look like maybe C++ or Java or Python, you know, the, the, those family of mm -hmm. languages, you'll have uh, object orientation, function, you know, sequence of statements, uh, conditions, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Of course, on top of that, as we said, we add all the specification aspect. And then in terms of what it actually looks like, if you look at the syntax, it is quite similar to something called Pascal. Which, which you may know. Yep. Yep. So, you know, we don't have that many curly braces. You have words to define the beginning or the end of a section, stuff like that. That tends mm -hmm. to be uh, anecdotal, like doesn't really make a huge difference nowadays. Uh, what, what you relate to, relates to uh, when you think of, of ADA is C++ or, yeah, maybe C++ is the closest one in particular mm -hmm. in terms of the compilation model. Or Rust, I would say, like Rust C++, because uh, unlike um, virtual machine-based languages, we compile everything to bare metal, you know, and as a consequence, we have something that is very efficient in terms of, of resources and, and speed that can run on incredibly small uh, hardware as well as very large mainframe systems. Okay, so some familiar faces. Perfect. So I, I, I want to know, what makes Ada different to other programming languages? You know, has it got any traits that, yeah. you know, distinctly make Ada, Ada? Absolutely. Specification. By far, the, if you look at Ada code, and if you look at any other language code, you will see a lot of things in the source code that is not code, that is constraints on the code or requirements on specification. Just to give you one or two examples. Uh, you're not going to say this is an integer. You're going to say these are miles and uh, actually that data type is constrained between zero and 1000 and then this is kilometers and this is maybe between 100 and 100 so you need to describe constraints on the type and constraints on, on, on your entire environment you know this this function is ordering an array and this is what ordered array looks like and now once you put all of these things together uh, together with the language that is 
uh, very anal about uh, being able to precise. Like there's not that much compiler specific uh, aspect of the language or undef undefined behavior. Like everything is very well defined. Uh, it gives you a platform that has uh, much more potential for self verification, if you will, either in the form of compiler verification, dynamic checks generated at, at runtime for you, or even for more proofs. Right. Interesting. So all um, you know, these semantics are obviously for a very particular reason, governing uh, a language that now allows it to be self-checking, right? So it's very, it's very safe, right? Where is Ada used most prominently today and what makes it so best suited for those applications? So when you're going to get the value out of the Ada language, it's places where you have a lot of either safety or security. Like think if something fails, people die, right? And, and for that reason, you'll see a lot of Ada in embedded systems, in large embedded systems. Uh, definitely the largest body of code is in our space and defense. You know, you don't want a plane to crash because of a software failure. You want, you want a missile to hit the wrong target because of software failures. And more and more as the market is developing as new places where reliability, safety, and security become paramount, we see more usage uh, of Ada in other places, uh, maybe more industrial places where we would not have expected that initially. Okay, so me and the people who are watching this now have a bit more of an understanding about Ada, which admittedly I did not have before. And I'm sure many of you didn't either. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to know, right, so you are from a company called AdaCore, and it would be rude of us to come on here today and not talk about AdaCore. Mm -hmm. So my first question about that is, where would Ada be if it wasn't for AdaCore? And sort of, is there something that AdaCore is comparable to for another language, perhaps? So um, to answer to your first question, Adaco was built in the mid-90s, and the mission of Adaco was to take over an open source project, which was the Ada uh, frontend of the GCC compiler. So if Adaco wasn't CF today, we will have most likely uh, uh, maintained open source compiler for Ada. And you know, I'm not going to put my money on a language that doesn't come with an open source compiler. I think that's dead on arrival. So, you know. I guess that's your first question, right? Um, I'm sure there would be Ada out there uh, still used because the people that are using Ada have systems that last for a long, long time. But I don't think that there would be a dynamic to push the Ada language further and complete the tool set. Now, um, if you want to know what Ada core does, uh, our historical mission, I would say, uh, up until maybe a year ago or, or so, or 10 years ago, was uh, we wanted to be the tool provider for the other language. So we have compilers, we have static analysis tool, we have testing, coverage, you know, all of these tools for the developer. But today we look at the world a bit more largely than that, and we care about the technologies that are being used for those high integrity embedded systems, which is the reason why we support C and C++ because this is part of the mix of technologies that you need to have to have a complete environment. But we also support, as of recently, Rust, uh, which becomes more and more popular. Uh, in those yeah, is, yeah. Cool. Okay, so I would like to also know about uh, what are the Ada Core offerings? You know, um, how would an engineer or developer who's working uh, in the Ada language mm -hmm. benefit from using your tools? Mm -hmm. And sort of what, what are those tools that you provide to them? So, so you could do one or two things, right? You could use the open source version of our tools that's yeah, available out there, and you get compiler, you get the basic tools, the basic tool suite, so that you can just get out there and start developing software without even talking to us, right? So, I mean, are you, are, you, are you telling people to go behind your back and go use something open source instead? Absolutely feel free mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, this is, this is the only way that technology survives these days, that people have all the great directing. But even in, in a commercial context, you know, grab this, make your product, uh, the added value that we're going to bring to you is when things get very serious. At some point, you're going to need tools that have industrial uh, great supports that have uh, safety certification demonstrations. Uh, you're going to want to have somebody to call if you have a problem. You're going to want to have uh, the latest fixes. You're going to want to have that weird target, that weird embedded target that nobody else is using. And all of these things, like when you, you reach this level of need, of industrial needs, that's where we come in and we're going to provide you with uh, the entire tool sets and the entire set of guarantees and support that you might require. Right, so it's a big time saver and it's support for the user who is implementing yeah. these tools. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, some big noise at the moment about NVIDIA with the Ada language. What's going on? 
So it's interesting that the noise is, being, is not because we've been working for NVIDIA and, and publicizing about NVIDIA's work for quite some time. I think the first references dates like six years ago where we made the first announcement. And as you can expect, uh, that was not the first time we were working with them. So uh, there are two things that uh, NVIDIA is doing, as a matter of fact. One uh, is they are developing firmware on GPUs with a specific version of ADA, which is called Spark. The reason why they okay. is that they want to enable uh, an analysis, which is called formal proof, which allows you to demonstrate with absolute certainty absence of certain defect of your software, including, for example, absence of buffer overflow. So let, let me say that once again. When you develop with Spark, with the way NVIDIA does for the firmware, so you know, at the core of, of their uh, systems, they have, yes, absolute guarantee of things such as absence of uh, buffer overflow. So you can see that from a cybersecurity standpoint, it's an extraordinarily strong argument here. Right. Now, that's the starting point. And as the technology made its way through the company, uh, it got adopted also by the uh, automotive group, like the, the, the team that, that developed the automatic, automotive stack on top of the hardware things, you know, hypervisor or drivers and those sort of things. And the reason why you're hearing so much about it right now is that that group did something that is quite unique in the industry, definitely. The safety certification ISO 26262 certification process. Nobody does that, right? And they published uh, that part of their workflow for Ada and Spark. So anybody that develops automotive software out there at the highest level of reliability yeah. has a pick that document, pick the Spark tool, and start to develop the way they develop. So you've got a reference pro process now. Yes. If it's a huge document, right? It's like, I don't know, 80 pages. Like it's, it's all you need to use Spark and Ada in those contexts. Mm -hmm. What sort of opportunities do you think that this document is going to open up for people in the future? Adopting a new programming language is hard, regardless of the language, right? We, we see that with, for example, and we definitely see that with Ada and with Spark. And it's hard because you need to train people, you need to adapt processes, you need to adapt new tools and so on and so forth. But one of the... Uh, the biggest question that you have very quickly is how do I um, extract the value of this new technology for my purpose? And, and this could be quite a journey to understand that. And that might depend on the kind of needs that you have, the kind of process that you have, the kind of industry you're in, and so on and so forth. Uh, with that document out there, it's, it's off the shelf. Like If I am designing an automotive system at the highest level of criticality, right? this so-called AZD, which is the the most critical, like the thing, if it fails, people in the car may be endangered. So that's very hard in itself. Now, if I if I want to do that at the, with the strongest tool is to, to some respect, right? To get the strongest guarantee, I can pick up that process off the shelf and apply it at home right away. Like I don't have to reinvent that yet, yet. how much work. I have all the steps, like the recipe to develop said software in that process. So that actually sounds quite similar to Misra C, right? This is pretty much Misra C for Ada, right? No, 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 no. no. So oh, no, no. It's a development process. So if you look at this C, Misra C does only one thing, which is subsetting the C language and adding rules so that you can start to trust uh, the basic of the language that you're using. But it says nothing on how you're supposed to develop. Uh, software. It doesn't talk about how you're going to test your software. It doesn't going to tell you how to apply some analysis. It going it doesn't to tell you how to connect software with requirements and so many other things. As a matter of fact, if you look at a reference process, you might have one line that says "Thou shall use Mishra C," and 150 pages of other stuff. That's how you know larger this this reference process totally mm -hmm. is. Right, and that's the, that's the real difference between that and ISO 26262. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. And you've given me and this whole audience of valuable information about Aided today. So I feel it's only fair to give you the chance to plug. Um, where can people find out more about Ada Core? So, I mean, there's two kind of need that you might have. If you just want to hear more about these things, maybe try out for yourself, I want to encourage you to go to learn.adacore.com and you get even interactive classes and a lot of information on how to start using the tool. You can also check out something called Alire, 
A L I R E, which is exclusive for mm-hmm. Alire, uh, which is like the the package manager for for Ada Crates, and you can install the compiler to that as well. So that that's if you want to try things on your own. If you have industrial needs, then uh, go on www.adacore.com and you know fill up a form, contact form, and we'll be happy to uh, to call you back and, and discuss your requirements in more details. Amazing. You heard the man. If you have questions, go there. Quinton, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. That was part one in a two-part series where we learn about the Ada programming language and Ada Core's offering, which, funnily enough, they suggest you can get elsewhere open source, but know that they're the obvious choice for easy adoption. That is confidence. Join Quinton and I in the next video where we'll be talking more about AdaCore's involvement in creating the reference process with NVIDIA, the importance of the reference process, and what's next for AdaCore 